Hey, 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 what up, what up, New Hope Church. Welcome all the campuses, Monday nights. We love you guys at all of our venues, all of our locations. Those of you checking us out online, we are thrilled that you are a part of us today. Hey, show of hands, this will be telling uh, for me. Um, how many of you get the weekly newsletter that we send out as a church? Weekly newsletter, show of hands. Wow, that's a lot of you. If you don't get that and you want that, mark your Connect card any Sunday and we send out like a devotional every single week. Um, now, moment of truth, we're in the church. Remember, you are in the house of the Lord. Be honest. How many of you read the newsletter? Okay, yeah, that's, that's encouraging, actually. Um, this week, there was a great newsletter article written, and it was about doormats, doormats. I didn't write it. It was our staff wrote it. Um, and I don't know if you saw it, but uh, how many of you have doormats at your house? Doormats? We all do. How many of you have doormats that have messages on them? Yeah, exactly. Most of them are welcome and that sort of thing. Uh, we went and found some doormat messages for you. This really makes me actually want to go get some of these. Here, here's the first one. Oh, no, not you again. <laughs> That's awesome. Watch, I like this next one. Watch this. Doorbell broken. Yell ding dong really loudly. And, and this might be my favorite one right here. Check this out. The neighbors have better stuff. <laughs> Just send them all to the neighbors, man. Uh, here, here's, a, here's a doormat that is the heartbeat of this church. And this is why some of you are here. But if you're new, this is a good word for you to realize today. Come as you are. Come as you are. That is the message that we have been lifting up high for 17 years now. And the beautiful thing is it's not original. We didn't come up with it. This really is the message of the gospel. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And uh, I'm going to ask you if you would to do something that I like to do. I think it's most appropriate. Would you please stand in honor of God's word? John chapter 8 verses 1 through 11. If you love the word of the Lord, let me hear you say bring it. Bring it. Oh my Lord, you are with me today. Here we go. Then all went home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. Now, interestingly enough, in our culture, when someone teaches, they usually stand up. It's kind of a position of authority. The listeners sit and the teachers stand. In Jesus' day, it was opposite. Those in authority, those engaged in that discourse, like I was telling you a few weeks ago, they would actually sit down to teach. So Jesus sits down to teach. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, the who? Pharisees. Pharisees you, know, you know that Pharisees didn't just exist back then. You know, the church is full of Pharisees, but I'm gonna get to that in a moment. Brought him, brought in a woman caught in what? Adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a, help me out, as a what? As a trap. It was a ploy. Make no mistake about it. They were trying to trap Jesus in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Ouch. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. So they've all left. And there's this intimate moment with Jesus and this woman caught in adultery. Now watch it, what the master does. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. 
Father God, would you take our minds and would you think through them? Would you take our hearts and fill with them today? Lord Jesus, take my lips and speak through them for if you do not speak, then absolutely nothing of any significance will have been spoken. We pray this in Jesus' name. And the people of God said together, amen Amen and amen. You may be seated. By far, one of my favorite passages in the New Testament. Maybe it's because of my story. Maybe it's because of uh, the fact that when I had a head-on collision with Jesus and he wrecked me, he wrecked me with his grace and his truth. But I absolutely love this story. And it's interesting that if you are studying the Bible with me, I know a lot of you are really studying the Gospel of John, maybe like never before, at the top of this particular passage in your Bibles, if you have a reputable Bible, you will actually find this parenthetical note. The earliest manuscripts do not have John 53 through 8, 11. A few of the manuscripts do include these verses wholly or in part. I just thought I should acknowledge that disclaimer. Now, I don't know what that does to you, but for me, I'll never forget the first time I heard it. It it doesn't impact my faith at all. If you know church history, uh, number one, er, some of the early manuscripts do have it. But number two, as I look at the life of Jesus and the gospels, this story is right in line with who he was and his character and how he interacted with people. And number three, if you know the history of canonization, you know that there were certain councils along the way, the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Chalcedon, which also brought together church fathers and church mothers, if you will, and they actually took the early manuscripts and through prayer and through discipline and through a a rigorous process, they brought together what we now hold in our hands as the Bible or the canon. The Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, the Greek New Testament, it's the Bible, it's the canon. So that really doesn't impact me, but I want to at least acknowledge it. I don't know if you realize this or not. I got a feeling many of you do. Maybe you've had experience with this. But the unfortunate reality is that the church, I'm just going to own it for us today, the church, historically speaking, especially in the South, can be made up of some of the meanest people on the planet. I mean, I I don't know why. I've never been able to come to terms with it. It's as if we in the Christian church, we have this Bible, but we haven't done a good job of reading it. But I don't know if you've ever been to some churches. But listen, Christians can just be some mean, mean people. And I don't know what the deal is with that. Not only can we be mean, Christians can be some of the most judgmental people on the planet. Have you experienced this? Just a sister's over there testifying with her hand up in the air. <laughs> Getting Pentecostal because we talk about mean people. Um, like, I, I, again, I don't know why that is the case. And when I had this head-on collision with Jesus and he wrecked my life with his grace and his truth, I then went out and I got involved in the church. And I got to tell you, there were times along the way that I was disappointed My first ministry position, I was a student pastor in a little old town called Manning, South Carolina. And I was a student pastor at a church called Manning United Methodist Church. And uh, I I took the job and I was so excited. And um, God started to show up and grow the student ministry. Such that not only were we reaching the students of that particular church, but we started having students come from all the other churches in town. Now, that can create a little tension with those churches, but we tried to make sure they understood we were on their side. We're all on the same team in the church. Can I get an amen? I'm so sick and tired of territorialism or competition in the body of Christ. Can I just let you know, maybe I've never said this to you before. Listen, we are not in competition with any other churches in this area. We are all on the same team, okay? When we get to heaven, there's not going to be a group of Presbyterians over here and they're all stiff and stoic because they starch their underwear. And there's not going to be a bunch of Baptists over here ridiculing everybody else. And there's not going to be a bunch of Catholics over here, you know, doing this right here. Listen, we're all going to be in the kingdom of heaven together because we're one body. So, so students started coming from other churches, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, all of that. But then something really cool started to happen. I thought it was cool. I found out quickly some of the elders didn't think it was cool. Then some students from, from the area started coming. They were unchurched. And, and they, didn't, they didn't quite look like Christians should look. 
Oh, Lord forbid. They had long hair. Oh, back then, that was a big issue. Lord forbid, some of the guys, oh, you're not gonna believe this, they had earrings. Oh, God. And, and, I know everybody gets ink today, but some of them had tattoos. Y'all down with me getting ink? I'm thinking about getting a tattoo. Y'all down with that? Some of, you, some of you will probably judge me for that. See, see, I threw that out there. I'm not even sure I'm gonna do it. I threw that out there just to test some of your judgmental spirit. Darn, I should have done this in the first service. Like, like I, I want to come in here. I was going to come in here one Sunday. I'm giving myself away. I was going to get henna tattoos. You know what henna tattoos are? Yeah. Henna tattoos are fake tattoos, but they look real. I was going to get full sleeve henna tattoos. And I was going to bust up in here this Sunday and start preaching and not even mention it. So that some of you pharisaical, judgmental people can get all upset, and then I might at the end tell you it was a henna tattoo. I have now blown my plan. it. Where was I? So some of, some, some of the folks showed up with tattoos and earrings and long hair, and I was like, this is awesome. And the students and I, we were high-fiving the leaders. We were so excited, and then we were going to have a sleepover. You, you, you remember when you had those sleepovers? Don't ever let a student pastor tell you those are fun. Those are straight from the pits of hell. It's when all the students get together in a gym and the goal is to stay up all night long. I'd rather watch the grass grow. It's miserable. But we were gonna have a, we were gonna have a sleepover. And lo and behold, some folks gathered around me. And they said, hey, we're excited that the student ministry is growing and we love what's going on. But we've noticed that there are some people around here that we're not quite sure we want them spending the night at the church. And I remember thinking, what are you talking about? Those are the very people that we want to reach. We want to be a student ministry where students can come regardless of who they are. And we welcome them in the church, not only students, but adults. And so this message that we've been trying our best to declare for 17 years is come what? As you are, say it with me, come as you are. One more time, like some of you are still hung up on me getting tats, I know. Um, come on, come as you are. One more time, come as you are. Listen, there is nothing more antagonistic to the purity of the gospel than religious people to scorn and ridicule and exclude people from coming to the foot of the cross. Nothing. As my mentor used to say, Dale Galloway, that's stinking thinking. That's poor thinking. And it was a great poem written by a man named Edwin Markham. And with liberty and license, I've tweaked it ever so slightly, but this is my heart for this church. You drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But God in love had the wit to win. Jesus drew a circle, come on, and took me in. Come as you are, regardless of your skin color, regardless of your socioeconomic level, regardless of what side of the tracks you grew up on, regardless of whether you went to college or what college you went to, regardless of whether you're a high school dropout, regardless of whether you get pregnant out of wedlock, regardless, 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 come as you are. And just so you know, this is just not some message that I've come up with. Look at this. Come on. You're, you're with me today. Read this out loud at all of our locations. Monday night, join us in. Ready? Go. Come to me, all ye who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. What's his first word? Come. It's not just a New Testament thing. That's Jesus in Matthew 11. Look at what Isaiah says. Come. All you who are thirsty, come on church, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come. Buy and eat, come. Buy wine and milk without money and without cost. And then the very same person who collected all the oral traditions and the manuscripts and put together the Gospel of John, he also wrote another book at the end of the Bible called the Book of Revelation. Out loud, go. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. 
the message of the gospel. And again, I don't know why the church has missed it so much. The message of the gospel is that you don't have to jump through certain hoops to get in. You don't have to pass a, an educational grade. You don't have to do anything but come just as you are. And notice the woman in John chapter 8. Notice she didn't deny her guilt. Like she was busted. She was guilty. But here's, here's the question I camp out on in the book a little bit. Have you thought about this? Where was the man? Ladies? Amen. Amen. Where, where was the dude? The last time I checked, and thankfully it's not from personal experience, praise God, but the last time I checked, it takes two to commit adultery. Now, he was nowhere there. Why? Because they were there to trap Jesus. They were there to bust Jesus. And because they were trying to trap him, Jesus, Jesus does this masterful thing. I, I don't know what you want to talk to God about when you get to heaven, but I want to ask Jesus this question. What were you writing, man? What, well, if you're, what was Jesus drawing in the dirt? I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, imagine this. Maybe he was jotting down the sins of the Pharisees and the religious leaders. Maybe it wasn't that profound. Maybe he was just doodling. Any of you doodle? Any of you doodle? You, you get a pen, you just doodle? Maybe he's just doodling. Maybe, I don't know, maybe he's so hacked off at the judgmental, rigid legalists, i.e. the Pharisees, that he has to just divert his attention to something else. Have you, you ever get so mad at somebody, you just gotta turn away? You know what I'm saying? You know that if you're gonna say anything, it ain't gonna be good. You ever, you ever get there? I don't know, maybe, maybe he just diverted himself. I, I'm not quite sure. But what's interesting is they wanted to trap him and Jesus knew like they knew that adultery called for stoning. So they, were, they had every right, even though it was wrong, they had every right to try to get her stoned. <laughs> get her stoned, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's funny right there. Um, <laughs> Oh, my Lord, where was I? They had every right to stone her, not get her stoned. Had every right to stone her. Now, what's interesting is this is Jesus. This is brilliant. Jesus knew that his time had not yet come. Remember, in John's gospel, in all the gospels, Jesus had his eyes on the cross. He came to die. He was not a victim. He came to lay down his life, but it wasn't time yet. And so Jesus does this brilliant thing where Jesus mentions stoning. The fact that he mentioned it enabled him to not get in trouble. They could have gone ahead and expedited uh, arresting him and maybe even crucify him. So Jesus knows he needs to use the language of stoning. So he does something brilliant. He says, if any of you are without sin, you stone her. And the older ones first started to walk away. And the rest started to walk away. To the point where it was finally just Jesus and this precious woman. Watch this. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. It's like he wasn't done. Here's where you see what we talked about in week one, John 1, 14, Jesus came from the Father, help me out, church, from the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. Now watch this. John 8 is a beautiful explanation, if you will, of John 1, 14. Jesus looks at this woman, then neither do I condemn you. What is that? It's grace. That's grace upon grace. He had every right to condemn this woman. But Jesus said, where'd they go? They left. Then neither do I condemn you. Everybody say grace. grace. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. What is that? That's truth. Everybody say truth. Grace, truth. Again, grace, truth. One more time. Grace, truth. 
Now we live in a culture and we live in a day and age. I'm gonna go ahead and go there for just a moment. We live in a day and age where, when it comes to sexuality anyway, everything is about grace. Everything is about whatever you wanna do, do it. Not only is it about that, if it feels good, do it. Not only is it about that, here's the reality. You know we live in this culture, and I'm just gonna touch on it for just a moment. We live in a culture where when it comes to sexuality and a lot of other things, but let's just talk about sexuality for a moment because that's what John 8 drives. Whenever we talk about sexuality in this culture, it's all about grace. It's all about whatever you wanna do, do it. And the moment, the very moment anyone starts to even suggest that there is an objective truth, that there is a way to enjoy sexuality that is God-honoring. The moment anybody in our culture starts to imply that there is some truth connected to sexuality, that person is figuratively, but almost literally, crucified in the public square and excluded from any conversations. Have you noticed this? It's just the way it is. So it's a very, very tricky subject. But I just want to point out, Jesus didn't say, neither do I condemn you. Peace out. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Now go and what? Leave your life of sin. There is a right and there is a wrong way to live out our sexuality. And the beauty of this passage is that we find it just dripping with grace and truth. And unfortunately, if you look at the history of the church, when it comes to sexuality and a lot of morality, the church has either erred on the side of grace, 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 where nothing really matters and nothing is really grounded on the word of the Lord, or the churches tend to lean on truth, 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 where it's all grace, and they'll beat you upside the head with the Bible if you're not careful, but there's no grace involved. And what we've tried to do, and I'm not saying we've aced it, but what we've tried to do is we tried to follow in this example of Jesus where whoever wants to come, just come. You're all welcome. Anybody's welcome. Moreover, you're not only welcome. Listen, we're not gonna judge you. We're not gonna exclude you. We're not gonna ridicule. We're not gonna sneer at you. We're just gonna welcome people because listen, it's not our job to clean people up. We just simply get people into the presence of God and God will clean people up. God will change lives. It's never been your job and it's never been my job to change a life. But God will change a life when it's grounded on his truth. Now, when I became a Christian, I don't know if you had this experience, but again, I know I'm talking about the South a lot, but in the South, I was taught, and I didn't even go to church, guys. I was totally never churched. But somewhere along the lines in my hometown, I believed that to be a Christian, you had to dress a certain way. To be a Christian, you had to talk a certain way. Have you ever heard it? I call it Christianese. (laughs) Oh, how you doing, man? Oh, praise the Lord. I didn't ask you to praise the Lord. I asked, how you doing? It, 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 just, it just becomes a part of our vernacular. So you have to look a certain way and you have to speak a certain way and you have to act a certain way. And so when I talk about welcoming people, I'm not just talking about the person who shows up at our church that has a checkered past or might not look like you might think he or she should look. But I'm also talking about the person who shows up at our church who looks like the Christian whatever that is anymore, right? Who, who plays the part? Like when I became a Christian, guys, here's what I believed. I believed that the first thing I had to do was burn all of my old rock and roll cassette tapes. <laughs> I still miss them. <laughs> and then I believed that I had to throw away all my clothes and I had to go buy preppy clothes. So then I believe that I also had to get a haircut because I had hair way down here and I was in gangs and fighting and all that kind of stuff. So I got this goofy little GQ haircut, if you will. Probably more like a mullet back then. Can you imagine this old boy with a mullet? And then, and then I got these preppy clothes. 
And I walked around as a preppy guy. And it never really worked for me. But I'm going to take you back to my hometown so that you can see a video. This might be uh, my favorite videos of all the videos we've shot. This is the guy that you've heard me speak about over the years. His name is Mark Yoder. He was my first student pastor. And uh, I want to take you back to Sumter and let you see this interview. Because he was the one who encountered me and had to course correct me and show me that Christianity was not about what you wear or what you look like. It's about so much more. Check it out. Hey, New Hope Church, if you have uh, listened to me over the years, um, you've heard me mention this student pastor who welcomed me, who discipled me, who loved me and poured into me. And so if God is doing anything in and through New Hope, a lot of it, I'm telling you, church, a lot of it must be credited back to Mark Yoder. And uh, I'm just so excited that you get to meet this guy tonight. And uh, we are videoing in an incredibly cold environment. <laughs> so if you see us shivering in me, that's what's going on. Um, I have my coat and gloves on. I have offered it to him and he doesn't want it, but it is cold. It is one of the coldest nights I've ever shot a video. But um, I digress, just so excited for you to meet um, who, Mark, I know I've told you this many times before, um, but just want to say it in this moment. Um, brother, what you did for me and the way you poured into me and the way you welcomed and received me, man, thank you. Thank you for um, what you did back then. And uh, I'm just so glad you also get to minister to the New Hope movement now. And the theme that we're talking about this week is uh, really a core value of New Hope Church, and it's come as you are. Mark, the beauty of having you speak to our church is that you're able to give an inside glimpse of uh, what it was like, <laughs> <laughs> what it was like to minister uh, to me. And it, it, I, I know that I've said this before, but I want to say it again. I'm so sorry uh, that every day about five o'clock, without exception, I'd get off of work and I'd go to Mark Yoder's house and I'd knock on the door and uh, I'd stay there till 10 or 11 o'clock at night. They would feed me supper. And uh, I don't know if you ever put me on your tax return, but you should have. <laughs> We're going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, just talk, talk to us when I say come as you are and yep. this whole theme, what comes to mind and, and oh, yeah. what did you say about our time together? Boy, I remember the first time you came. Um, and I, there's so many different faces of Benji that I know. And that first one, I really only got one evening glimpse of because, man, you were decked out. Uh -huh. Tommy dressed nice. And it was honestly very out of place. So awkward. <clears throat> so awkward. <laughs> Tell them how I came looking. I mean, prepped out and, I mean, khakis, penny loafers. I walked in and I thought, you are such a goober to myself. <laughs> but, but I had been convinced, you know, I grew up not going to church at all. But somewhere along the lines in the South, as I watched yeah. Christians, I had been convinced you had to look a certain way, dress a certain way, act a certain way. And you, on our very first encounter, blew that out of the water. Mm. Well, I think... You were you, you came maybe a little bit late because I know we didn't talk beforehand. Yeah. And I remember seeing you sitting. We, we, we talked a little bit afterwards, introduced, I found out who you were. And it was well after that that I found out your story. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I love of, of our students um, is that I didn't have a single person come up to me before I found out how God had wrecked you yeah. and your testimony of drugs and getting arrested, yeah. not a single student came up to me and say, hey, you need to know this about him. Yeah. No adults did that. And I love that, mm. that, that they knew you. Yep. They knew your story. Everybody did. But they didn't do that. And I value that incredibly. Um, so as, as we talked and as you and I developed a relationship, that, that happened very, very fast because you were so interested in getting plugged in, which I loved. Yeah. One of the things that I hope is that I encourage all of us to just, man, just be who you are. Yeah. And when, one of the reasons why I encourage that in you is that I got a glimpse of who you were. Yeah. 
And man, I want people to see that. Man, thank you. Thank you for uh, doing that in my life. Um, thank you for the way you discipled me. You poured into me. And, and as I was getting ready for this time with you, I went to the chapter that we're studying and I, I wrote this. I said, the clear message of the gospel is that God welcomes us just as we are. And this is where it's about you. Honestly, I have absolutely no idea where I would be today if the first church I attended at the age of 18 had shunned me because of my addictions, criminal activities, or the way I looked on the surface. I think it is safe to say I would not be sitting here writing this book or leading New Hope Church. Can I just say this because, because you won't say it? <clears throat> when I look at, what, man, what a blessing that God did to send you our way. Mm. And if one of the small steps in you pursuing Christ was you happened to come to a place that did not shun you, man, how much the kingdom, and I'm saying this to you, Benji, how much the kingdom would, lo would have lost if we'd have done that. Uh. So to those people at New Hope, yeah who have somebody that they they want to hold at arm's distance, you have no idea what that person's going to do for the kingdom. That's a good word. Yeah. If, if, if I had walked in there and I found a group that I could see it in their sneers or they, they were judging me with their eyes or they were mean-spirited, Mark, I don't know. I don't know what I would have done. I was so insecure and I had so much junk inside of me and what I found was a community that truly represented Jesus. Yeah. They were Jesus to me. You were Jesus to me. And I felt nothing but love and warmth. But man, imagine, yeah. imagine if that were not the case. What would you say about just the redemptive potential of every encounter we have yeah. and this whole concept of, of just being welcoming to everybody? Yeah, I'm afraid to know the times that people have walked in as you did, nervous and, and almost looking for a reason not to come back. Absolutely. And I gave them plenty because I, I didn't reach out to them the way that I should. I, I might have, maybe I didn't embrace them or welcome them or I wasn't excited because of, I mean, honestly, because they didn't fit in like other people did. They weren't as easy as others. And I, it scares me to think of the people that yeah. have not landed where you are. Yeah. The other part of that is nobody in that room when you came in knew what tonight was going to look like. Mm -hmm. The history of what God has done, not mm -hmm. only in you, but through you. Mm -hmm. And God absolutely wrecked you. Oh, my word. He wrecked you. And yeah. wow, how much better yeah. you and we all are for it. Oh, my Lord. He, 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 he wrecked me and he redeemed me. And, and now um, bringing us full circle just is, is so special. I just want to thank you. Mm -hmm. Again, you were my family. You, you were like a dad to me. Hmm. And um, can we just say older brother? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you definitely, you definitely not old enough to be a dad. But like, you know, if if I were Timothy, you would be my Paul. Uh, and um, I will forever be grateful for you. And. Um, so thankful that you spent a little bit of time with us tonight. Ah, uh, it's my pleasure. Yep. My yep. pleasure. God bless you, New Hope. Church, what we're talking about is a word that has been a part of our core values from day one. It's this whole idea of authenticity that we're just gonna be real. We're just gonna be real regardless of who we are. We don't have to dress up to play the part. We don't have to dress down if we like to dress up. We're just gonna be authentic. We're gonna be real. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I talk about in the book, I'm not already talking about it today, but like I was an old school rock and roller. I've already mentioned that. And there was this great song that we used to sing in the old days called Signs, Signs, Everywhere Signs. Remember that? Breaking up the scenery, changing my mind. Do this, don't do that. Can't you read the signs? Any old school rock and rollers in the house? Yeah, so we used to talk about signs and, and we're not gonna put up signs around this church. If we are gonna put up a sign, here's a sign that we should put up. No perfect people allowed. No perfect people. And again, I don't know why, but the church has just been notorious 
for picking and choosing those sins that we don't like, normally that we don't struggle with, and actually judging and sneering and ridiculing other people. We just like to keep it real at New Hope. Why? Why? Here's why. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at what, church? The outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. So let us never be. Let us never become that place that is inauthentic. Where somebody feels like they have to do this or they have to do that just to be accepted. No, no, no. Let us choose to be a place that embraces authenticity. I want to give you an author that you should really lock into. And I'm just going to tell you, she's, she's a little raw, but that's why I like her. Her name is Brene Brown. And uh, yes, yeah, some of you have read her. I'm telling you, and, and ladies, oh my Lord, she's amazing. But guys, it's not, she's not just a lady author. She is an incredible author. And look at what she says here. Authenticity is a collection of choices that we have to make every day. It's about the choice to show up and be what? Just be real. We're all just a bunch of beggars trying to tell a bunch of beggars where to find bread. Just be real. The choice to be what? Honest. The choice to let our true selves be seen. Religion is all about the outward appearance. Religion is all about man's attempt to try to reach God. Christianity is not religion. Christianity is about letting God reach us. Christianity is about a relationship. Legalism Listen, legalism looks at salvation as a wage earned on deeds done. That's what legalism is. And come on, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because it's probably way more than we would like to acknowledge. So many of you grew up in rigid, legalistic environments. You were convinced you were never good enough. You were convinced you would never measure up. And your Christianity, quote unquote, could be described as one guilt trip after another. It's legalism. That is not the message of Jesus. That's what legalism is. Grace sees salvation as a gift. A what? Yes. Gift based on Christ's death. It's a gift. Now, what do you know about a gift? You can't earn a gift. The only thing you can do with a gift is just receive it. If it's a true gift, you just receive it. And so my prayer today has been that we as believers, those of you who are here and you, you know the Lord, that we would commit yet again to make sure if we're ever gonna have a sign at this church, it's just come as you are. We just welcome and we receive people, whoever they are. If they come in amongst us and we need, they need a seat, what do we do? We get up out of the seat and we give them a seat. We don't look at them and say, this is my seat. And if somebody needs a parking place, we park down the road if we have to. Because we don't want to do anything to hinder people from getting in the presence of God. Can I get an amen? amen. Come as you are. But because that is who we are, come on, come on. Every Sunday, there are people here. And with a crowd this size, it's probably quite a few of you at the campuses as well, or maybe you're watching online. And the truth is, you've been judged, you've been ridiculed, you've been beaten up, you've experienced rigid religion, but for some reason, you're at New Hope. Maybe it's because you've heard that we are a come as you are church who will love you and give you grace, but who will teach the truth of the word. And maybe you're here, just maybe you're here today. And the truth is what you really need is a head on collision with Jesus. You are not what everybody has been telling you that you are. You are not the lies that you have been told since you were small. 
You're not a result of something somebody else has done to you. You're not a result of all of the bad things you might have done to yourself. Listen to me. You are a child of the Most High God. And he loves you. And he looks at you. You need to stop looking into the eyes of human beings. And you need to, with eyes of faith, look into the eyes of a God. His name is Jesus, who knelt down on the ground and then looked at that adulterous woman and said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And maybe what you need to do today is you need to forget about all the other voices. And maybe it's your own voice. And you need to look into the eyes of God and realize that he loves you with a love that you could never even begin to earn, even if you tried. And yet the good news is you don't have to earn it. The Bible says there is now, therefore, what, church? No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He loves you this much, and he says, come. Come to me. Don't come to a religion. Don't even come to a church name. No, 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 no. Come to Jesus and let his love wreck you. Not from the outside in, but what? From the inside in out. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you that um, I get the unbelievable privilege of loving and serving and knowing a church that really celebrates this come as you are idea. A church, Lord God, that, that follows in the footsteps of Jesus and welcomes and receives people regardless of anything. God, may we commit to that today afresh and anew. May we live in John chapter 8 and may we continue to do everything we can, oh God, to bring people into your presence, not in a judgmental way, not hoping that God will stone them or excommunicate them or stiff arm them. But instead, God, may we continue to do everything we possibly can to bring people into your presence because we know that in doing so, they're going to encounter a love divine, a love that welcomes, a love that receives, a love that embraces, and a love that then dispenses truth and helps us get our lives back on track. Father, for the person who is here, and they feel a lot like the woman in John 8. They feel judged. They feel embarrassed. They feel rejected. They feel like they're too thin or they're too fat. Their skin's not the right color. Their their morality is off base. And God, somewhere along the way, they've been taught that that you reject them. If that's you, on behalf of Christ himself, and on behalf of pastors and churches, I apologize. I'm sorry that you've been given that message somewhere along the way. But I've come by today to let you know that you are a child of the Most High God. That you are treasured, that you are loved. That God created you in your mother's womb. You're not here by accident. And he invites you to look into his eyes. He invites you to receive his love, his grace, his truth. And if you desire that today... I'm just going to give you a chance in this moment to receive that. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm guilty of so many things. Authenticity is not about acting as if we're not guilty. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. But because I'm a sinner, Lord Jesus, I need you to be my Savior. So I come to you. I invite you into my life. 
I thank you for dying on a cross for me. I thank you for the blood of Jesus where you paid a sin debt, a price that I could not pay for the forgiveness of those sins. Thank you for not condemning me. And thank you for giving me your word and the future to go and sin no more. So Lord, I come in all of my needs and I receive you. Be my Lord and Savior. Help me follow you all the days of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you just prayed that in any kind of way, I want to tell you two things. One is, I want to give you a Gospel of John. If you don't have a Bible or you want a Gospel of John, just go to our resource center outside at any of our campuses and we've got a gospel of John for you. And secondly, we want to let you know as a church family, welcome to the family of God. Welcome. The Bible says you have been born again. You are an adopted child of God. And church, we're going to end worship a little differently today. Trust me, you don't want to leave. We're going to sing a song over you. It's not really a song that we sing together, but if you know it, you can sing it. You've probably heard it on the radio. We're going to sing this song over you, and you're welcome just to, to receive this. If you want to stay seated, you surely can. If you feel like you can't contain yourself and you want to stand, you surely can. But let me share with you some lyrics. And it really, John 8 is a great background for this. You say, I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say, I am strong when I think I am weak. Don't you want to think like God thinks about you? You say, I am held when I am falling short. And when I don't believe, you say, I am yours. It's a powerful, powerful song. Maybe it's time you start listening to the voice of God instead of the voices of others or the voice of yourself that can speak negative falsehoods over your life. Let this song minister to you in this sacred moment. Remind me once again just who I am because I need 